Thank you very much. Good morning, and welcome to the City Council's seventh day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. My name is Daniel Drum, and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on Public Safety, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Donovan J. Richards. We're also joined by my other colleagues, Barry Grudenchik and Rory Lansman. And I think others will be joining us shortly. Today we will hear from the New York Police Department. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Finance Division staff for putting today's hearing together, including the Director, Latanya McKinney, Committee Counsel, Rebecca Chasen, Deputy Directors, Regina Pareda Ryan and Nathan Toth, Unit Head, Isha Wright, Finance Analyst, Nevin Singh, the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit, Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan, Latina Brown, and Courtney Summer Summarized, who pull everything together. Thank you all for your efforts. I'd also like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of the budget hearings on May 23rd, beginning at approximately 2 p.m. in this room. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Today's executive budget hearing starts with the police department. The NYPD's fiscal 2020 executive budget totals $5.6 billion, which supports a total headcount of 51,585, of which 36,113 are uniform positions. In the executive plan, the NYD shows savings and pegs totaling $52.6 million across fiscal 19 and fiscal 2020. However, these modest savings are more than offset by the addition of $74.3 million in new needs over the same period. One area where the Council had hoped to see deeper savings was with respect to the Department's overtime budget. The NYPD's actual spending on uniform overtime consistently exceeds its budgeted amount. In fiscal 2017, the NYPD overspent by $82.3 million, and in fiscal 2018, the number was $51.8 million. In fiscal 19, the year-to-date spending on uniform overtime through March was $448.9 million, even though the total budget for the year is $548 million. To that end, the Council has encouraged the NYPD and OMB to right-size the overtime budgets to more accurately align with actual spending and to also impose overtime controls to help contain costs. The Council recently learned from the news that last month the NYPD imposed a new overtime control policy that would cap the number of hours of overtime that could be earned. I understand, therefore, high-ranking detectives, lieutenants, and sergeants, overtime will be capped at 30 hours per month and 90 hours quarterly. Police officers, detectives, and sergeants will have an overtime cap of 20 hours per month and 60 hours quarterly. While the steps the agency is taking are positive, the Council should not have to learn about these types of policy changes by reading in the newspaper. I would hope going forward that the Council would be briefed before the press, and I look forward to learning more about the details of the overtime cap at today's hearing. Now, before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to three minutes per council member, and if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. I will now turn the mic over to my co-chair, Council Member Richards, for his statement, and then we will hear from the NYPD Commissioner James O'Neill. Thank you, Chair Drum, and good morning, and welcome to the Public Safety Committee's Fiscal 2019 Executive Budget. Uh, before we begin, I would like to address the Danube Pantaleo trial happening across the street at One Police Plaza and reaffirm my commitment to supporting Eric Garner's mother, Gwen Carr, in her five-year pursuit for justice. The world watched as her son was killed while in the hands of the NYPD, and there is no doubt in my mind that he would be alive today if a chokehold was not placed around his neck on that tragic day in 2014. I know the commissioner cannot comment about the case until the trial is completed and a recommendation is sent his way from the CCRB. But I do want to say that the world will be watching once again, and more importantly, the residents of this city will be watching this very closely. The results of this case will send a message to New Yorkers, as well as every NYPD officer, about how the NYPD will hold their officers accountable in 2019 and beyond. 
Justice has been delayed for far too long, but we still have an opportunity to ensure that justice is not denied. Lastly, I expect the commissioner to be fair and impartial in his decision and to consider the public needs for accountability as much as the officer's right to a fair trial. Today, we will hear testimony from Commissioner O'Neill and his staff on the, P the police department's budget. The department's fiscal 2020 executive budget, as uh, Council, uh, Chair Drum said, is 5.6 billion and supports a budgeted headcount of approximately 52,000 personnel. The updated budget for fiscal 2019 is now 5.9 billion and reflects changes that occurred throughout the fiscal year that adds to the department's budget. New in the executive budget is roughly $30 million for the renovate, renovation of select precincts to be in full compliance with the American Disability Act guidelines, as well as $11 million for other IT projects at NYPD facilities. Today, I hope to learn more about the department's ongoing initiatives, its capital program, and the budget priorities for fiscal year 2020. I also look forward to hearing more about the changes since we last met at the preliminary budget hearing in March. Throughout this past year, the department has worked to finish the implementation of the Neighborhood Policing Program, the Right to Know Act, and has outfitted patrol officers with body-worn cameras. I would like to thank the department on their work to implement these measures that not only provide greater oversight, but will aid in reducing crime and, at the same time, improving community relations. I would also like to thank my staff, uh, Jordan Gibbons and the committee staff, financial analyst Nevin Singh, committee counsel Dan Uatis, and policy analyst Casey Addison for their hard work. In the interest of time, I would like to get started. Thank you, Commissioner O'Neill, and to your staff for being here today. Please begin when you are ready. Oh, swear. I ask counsel to swear in the panel, please. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss with you the mayor's executive budget for the 2020 fiscal year. It's a pleasure to be here again to testify before the City Council's Committee on Finance and Public Safety about the outstanding work the members of the New York City Police Department continue to do every day and every night. Each time I testify in this capacity, we discuss the absolute need for the police and all the people we serve to build trust and strengthen our relationships in every neighborhood. This is essential to sharing the responsibility for public safety. The police cannot do it alone. Earning and putting into real action the full and willing support of all New Yorkers is imperative on, to driving crime and disorder down past the record low levels we have already achieved. This is a crime-fighting philosophy that is the basis for neighborhood policing, New York policing, if you will. And it is, by the way, of this proven crime-fighting model that we will continue to keep this great city safe and to make sure everybody in every community also feels safe, too. As you've heard me say before, our job at its most fundamental level is to fight crime and keep people safe. And that is what every NYPD member swore an oath to do. And so, before highlighting some key budget items this morning, I'd like to speak about changes looming at the city and state levels that I believe will significantly hamper our collective ability to adequately accomplish that mission. I will be as brief as possible so our team may field as many of your questions as we can in the time we have available. The leadership of the NYPD agrees with advocates, elected officials, agency heads, residents, and others that as a society, we must find better ways to deal with the homeless and the mentally ill. We must work harder at keeping at-risk youth out of the criminal justice system to begin with. We must help offenders leaving jail or prison successfully reintegrate into their communities. We must connect substance abusers to necessary treatment. And we must take every single illegal gun off of our streets. The central issue, of course, is how to accomplish these shared goals while continuing to reduce overall crime and violence, addressing quality of life concerns, and keeping safe and free from fear all New Yorkers and the police who serve them. Public safety cannot be compromised. Recently, the state legislator passed, legislature passed a measure taking effect in January that will greatly reduce the number of arrested people for whom judges may require bail or make a determination to remand. As currently enacted, this law will have a continuing and severely negative impact on public safety. The NYPD favors responsible bail reform. There is no reason to hold nonviolent minor offenders who pose no danger to public safety on cash bail of any amount. But in this era of downward trending crime rates and enhanced trust with the people we serve, 
Any reform package should allow judges to remand any arrested person who poses a danger to others as measured by the gravity of the offense for which they have been arrested and also by the gravity of offenses they have committed in the past. The new law makes no such provision, failing to consider the public safety consequences of violent recidivists being released because judges are constrained. This will make New York one of only four states in the nation that does not allow its judges to weigh the dangerousness of a person in determining whether to remand that person or to set bail. Under the new law, for instance, judges will be expressly forbidden from remanding individuals or setting bail in the case of low-level robberies and burglaries and virtually all drug trafficking cases, no matter how many prior offenses the robbers, burglars, and drug dealers may have. Simply put, this is a policy that is far too weak to ensure our public safety in our neighborhoods. The new law also requires that many arrested people be released with desk appearance tickets, or DATs, without even being held for arraignment. Typically, those who are issued DATs are released from police station houses within a short time following their arrest. What we know is that approximately one quarter of people released on DATs never appear for the scheduled court dates, and DATs have a negligible effect on chronic offenders. Under the new law, about 16,000 people arrested in 2018 with prior arrest involving force, weapons, or sex offenses would have been released with DATs. Among them, 3,300 people with prior felony assault arrests, 2,000 people with prior robbery arrests, and 200 people with prior sex offense charges, including rape and sexual assault. In fact, approximately 1,000 people arrested in 2018 would have been released with DATs under the new law, despite each of them having records of five or more arrests for violent crimes in the prior three years. Some bail reform advocates try to make it appear that arrests for minor crimes are swelling the city's jail population with individuals held on bail. In actuality, the opposite is true. As a matter of police policy, the NYPD has systematically reduced the number of misdemeanor arrests, which are down 38 percent in the past five years and about 87% of the people who are arrested are released at arraignment or before without bail or incarceration. The fact is, New York City's jail population has been declining for years, down 29% since 2013 and 63% since 1993. In reality, the average number of fair evaders awaiting trial on any given day is two. The average number of public marijuana smokers is one. The average number of people charged with prostitution is zero. With New York City's overall crime now at its lowest level since 1957, some state legislators seem to have lost sight of what it takes to keep crime down. Last year was the second year in a row we had fewer than 300 murders, less than any year in New York City since 1951, when there were half a million fewer people in our city. Also in 2018, we recorded the lowest number of shootings in our modern history for the third year in a row. On five separate occasions, the city went five or more days without a recorded murder, including for nine consecutive days. And for the first time ever, we recorded three straight months, October, November, and December, below 20 murders. In these past five years, neighborhood policing has pushed both crime and enforcement down substantially. Overall, crime declined by 14.2 percent and murders by 11.9 percent. Shooting incidents are down 31 percent. Compared to the five-year period prior, the average number, the average for murders now is 30 percent lower, and the average for shootings is 29 percent lower. We are not just achieving massive declines in violence. With our intensified and focused investigation of gangs, we are sustaining those declines over the longer term. In our other categories, robbery is down 32.6% in five years. Burglary is down 33.3%. Auto theft is down 26.4%. Maybe hard to believe, but there were more than 140,000 auto thefts in New York City in 1990. Last year, there were just over 5,000, a reduction of about 96%. On the enforcement side, during the past five years, street stops by our officers are down by more than 90 percent. Overall arrests are down 37.3 percent, and summonses are down nearly 79 percent. Marijuana misdemeanor and violation arrests are down 71 percent. As we believe we could in 2014, we have shown that we can drive crime down significantly with a far less intrusive enforcement profile. While arrests and summonses for quality of life violations and minor crimes are way down, felony arrests for rape, assault, grand larceny, and burglary are all up. And while many misdemeanor arrest categories have fallen steeply, Detective Bureau arrests are up nearly 20 percent in the last five years. In short, New York policing is a game changer for our profession and a model for the rest of the United States. As such, we vow not to rest until every block and every neighborhood enjoys the same level of safety and well-being as the rest of the city. One zip code must never be the primary determination of one's safety. It is our pledge to ensure that every neighborhood is safe regardless of where in New York City one calls home. 
As I said at the beginning of my testimony, however, this job can only be accomplished in partnership with the rest of our city inside and outside government. Out of this historic collaboration, more change is coming. Change in how we police, how we partner with our fellow city agencies and elected officials, how we partner with neighborhood residents and workers, and how we partner with business and civic leaders. Each of these partnerships stand to generate the creative and innovative solutions that adequately address the entire public safety spectrum, from traditional crime to terrorism, to the seedbed activities that can draw young people down paths of criminality. At the end of the day, Brownsville can and should be as safe as Brooklyn Heights. Violence and disorder should be as low in the South Bronx as it is on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. This is a new era in many ways. We know, for example, that the legalization of marijuana is coming at some point and we need to determine how and when laws about its use and possession are enforced. I still have major concerns about home cultivation and driving while impaired because there is currently no instant test for marijuana levels in the human body. What will we decide to do about people under 21 years of age smoking marijuana? We're also facing pushback from some quarters about the definition of who constitutes a threat to public safety when it comes to fair evasion in our subways. I think everybody would agree that we need to control the entrance to the subway system to make sure we keep all the riders as safe as possible. To abandon our efforts there would be both irresponsible and highly dangerous. Turning to budgetary issues, the Homeland Security Preparedness Grant Application Guidelines have been released. The NYPD has now submitted project proposals under the Federal Fiscal Year 2019 Homeland Security Grant Program to the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget, budget which will coordinate the city's submission. In addition, the NYPD is submitting applications under the Transit and Port Security Grant Programs. It is anticipated that these grants will be awarded no later than September 30th, 2019, and we are hopeful that the NYPD will receive the same amount of funding under the Federal Fiscal Year 2019 Homeland Security Grant Program that we received last fiscal year. As I mentioned during my preliminary budget hearing testimony in March, the NYPD relies on these funds to help protect all New Yorkers and visitors to our city against terrorist attacks and to strengthen our homeland security preparedness. Specifically, federal funds have allowed the NYPD to develop and sustain our sensor and information technology centerpiece known as the Domain Awareness System, or DAS, which supports the police department's counterterrorism mission, hire intelligence research specialists, deploy officers to the transit system and to strategic locations citywide based on intelligence, and train officers to respond to chemical, ordnance, biological, and radiological threats as well as active shooter scenarios. The NYPD also uses federal funds to purchase personal protective equipment for uniformed members of the service and to purchase critical equipment that enhances our members' ability to protect New Yorkers and cr critical transportation and port infrastructure. Regarding the executive budget and its impact on the NYPD, the N NYPD's fiscal year 2020 city tax levy expense budget is $5.3 billion. This, the vast majority of this, 91 percent, is allocated for personnel cost. Highlights in the executive budget include additional funding for IT maintenance, totaling $11.3 million annually, funding for 64 additional school crossing guard posts, totaling $960,000 in fiscal year 2020 and the out years, in order to fulfill the police department's commitment towards compliance with the American with Disabilities Act, funding of $162,000 in fiscal year 2019, and $2.4 million in fiscal year 2020 in expense funds to cover building rehabilitation work that cannot be covered with capital funds. The NYPD's 10-year capital commitment plan contains $2.1 billion for fiscal years 2019 through 2029. The executive capital plan included additional funding of $29.3 million for ADA compliance renovations. The police department's goal is to have fully or partially accessible public areas within station houses in as many as, as our facilities as possible. In closing, I can tell you our city is, much, is in much better shape today than it was when I became a cop back in 1983. Those of you who lived and worked here decades ago know it too. And each year we make even greater headway. Together we are proving that New York City is the place that others across our country want to emulate. And we are settling, and we are setting that tone through New York policing. Throughout the tremendous changes we continue to undertake in the NYPD, we have had Mayor de Blasio's full support, and we have benefited greatly from the City Council's support as well. I, want to, I thank you for your ongoing partnership and assistance and for everything you do to help us build a more effective and more efficient NYPD, always with our officer safety in mind. In my experience, there is a direct correlation between the level of community support for the police and success in fighting crime and terror. 
And so we will continue to work tirelessly to earn and keep the trust and confidence of all New Yorkers and to ensure that there are even better days ahead. I look forward to working with each of you, and I thank you again for the opportunity to testify this morning. At this point, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Adams and, and uh, Steve Mattiel as well, our, ma our minority leader. Uh, congratulations on the tremendous reductions in crime that we have seen under your leadership. Uh, it's uh, really been uh, wonderful. Um, I just want to talk a little bit first about overtime. As I mentioned in my opening, I understand that the department has a new overtime control plan. Can you walk us through the new plan and including when it will take effect and the amount of overtime savings you will, uh, that you'll achieve? Yeah. Uh, Vincent Grippo, Deputy Commissioner, Management and Budget. I, I want to make uh, pretty clear here that there, there really is not a new overtime control plan. For the last three, or actually and this would be the fourth fiscal year, that we have been operating under what we call a uniformed overtime cap. Uh, in all of those years, we have been looking at, we have non-discretionary overtime, which is details and assignments that require us uh, to use a certain amount of overtime throughout the year. Um, and then we've got other buckets of non-discretionary overtime where we have cops extending their tours for uh, activity where they can't go off the tour. Um, then we have discretionary overtime that's used in targeted ways. That overtime has been for the last four fiscal years uh, under a strict budget. And what happens in every one of those four years is we have to look at the non-discretionary overtime, which can be driven by factors outside of the department's control. So in any given year, that overtime can be higher or lower. Um, that impacts the budget we have for discretionary overtime. And so then across the department, decisions are made on how much of the discretionary overtime is authorized. What you know ran in the newspaper is the department doing what it's done over the last four years, and frankly, it's done before the overtime cap existed, which is simply managing the overtime in an intelligent way that prioritizes public safety, whether it's crime fighting on patrol or investigations in the Detective Bureau that are critical to maintain. So as you can see from this slide, many of the most common positions at NYPD exceed 20 or 30 hours of overtime per month. Uh, will um, all uniform members of the service um, uh, be impacted by the cap? Um, can you indicate where you think you'll see the most savings? I would stress again that the, the, the notion that there is a cap as was represented in the papers is really not accurate. What's happening is, again, on a case-by-case -case basis down to the command level, there is a budget for discretionary overtime and that budget, um, ultimately they have to manage that budget and they do it in various ways. In some, in some instances there may be a reduction uh, across the board, in some instances there may be targeted reductions, but it's reductions in discretionary overtime, we are still authorizing overtime as needed for all of our crime fighting initiatives, um, all of those critical public safety initiatives that we have. So it would be in all those areas that are on the slide? Well, this is, um, you're doing it by rank, it looks like. For the, the, uh, so first of all, the uniformed overtime cap does not affect school safety agents, traffic enforcement agents, um, and criminalists. Okay. Uh, nor does it affect the PAAs. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm missing any of the, or the PCTs. So they have separate budgets, each of those, um, and we deal with that in a, a, a separate way. So, so it would only affect the uniform titles, and again, it's managing to an overall a uniformed overtime cap and trying to stay within that cap. Okay, thank you. Uh, regarding um, police communications technicians specifically, um, excessive overtime can cause burnout. Does the department have a need for more technicians and what resources are provided to technicians to avoid burnout? We're assessing that now, so we have been doing an analysis. Part of the increase in overtime this year is related to training the PCTs on text to 911, which is a new initiative. So if you look at the overtime last year, it's not as significant as this year. This year that program is driving it. 
We're going to evaluate the PCT staffing level through this year into next fiscal year once text to 911 has been implemented. And at that time, we'll work with the mayor's office if we believe a headcount increase is needed. Okay, thank you. Um, in the executive budget plan, the department reduced headcount, including 102 positions as part of the hiring freeze, 130 vacancy reductions, and five positions eliminated, eliminated from the juvenile crime desk. Which titles are included in the hiring freeze? So ultimately what we're doing, we have about 400 uh, civilian non-safety vacancies, and those range across civil service titles. Um, at the current time, the agreement here is to freeze 100 of those positions. So it brings, it essentially brings our headcount in fiscal year 20 down by 100 positions. The department is going to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis when we deal with either the current vacancies or attrition. Um, we will be prioritizing those vacancies so that impact to safety, impact to staffing levels in the commands, things that could impact civilianization will be prioritized and we'll be looking at essentially the less essential non-safety civilian positions that will have to remain vacant because of the hiring freeze. The 100 positions in terms of impact to the department, I think you'd say you're relatively small uh, given this fact that the size of our non-safety civilian population uh, is about 7,000 employees. So with respect to the traffic enforcement agent positions, there are about 200 open and 130 have been cut. So what was the rationale in reducing those vacancies in the Traffic Enforcement Division? So um, the thing that's important to understand about the TEA vacancy or the TEA headcount is we are actually getting a 70-person um, increase if you look at the staffing level in fiscal 19. So we had, we had essentially pegged 200 TEA positions just for fiscal 19 in the last savings plan last year. Um, we did an assessment throughout the year of the TEA staffing. We're looking at all the Vision Zero initiatives, all the mayor's initiatives around congestion mitigation, and we've come to an, a conclusion that that headcount of, of adding 70 and sub permanently subtracting the 130, that's the headcount we believe works to implement all those programs. So, so it's a, I was going to say, so do you have metrics that you use to determine uh, the effectiveness of the TEAs, or how does that work? Yeah, we do. We can, I mean, we could share that with you in terms of going over. We look at, again, prioritizing Vision Zero safety-related enforcement and prioritizing congestion mitigation uh, at points throughout the city where we see, and, and that varies on a, a, a myriad of different initiatives like Block the Box, uh, there, countless. So we can, we can sort of share with you how that, how that looks in terms of resource allocation and cost. So do you know now uh, what areas new hires would be stationed? New, new hires? I, TEAs? I, we're really maintaining headcount. Chief Chan, do you want to add? Yeah. Case. Go ahead. Again, we, we take a look at the- State your name for the record. Chief Thomas Chan, uh, Chief of Transportation. Uh, we take a look at uh, our actual deployment of our personnel, and again, there, there are many um, uh, mayoral programs, uh, safety initiatives, clear, clear lanes, bus lanes, and things of that nature, and there's a uh, normal attrition and give it, uh, about approximately 10% of our personnel. We fulfill those positions uh, in terms of the attrition first, and we take a look at the various programs, whether they're going to be level twos or level ones and things of that nature, and then we'll deploy them and replace them as needed. About 70 vacancies remain open though, right? And w what happened is that uh, uh, we are waiting the next class, and so uh, based on that, uh, we'll take a look at, and again, we do have um, traffic agents that transition to, uh, to become police officers and, uh, and normal retirement, things of that nature, so we are working to fill those positions. Uh, what is the attrition rate for the TEAs? Uh, TEAs approximately uh, uh, 300 per year. 300, wow. Um, and when are they eligible for promotion and raises? Um, the agents actually, um, uh, of the new hires, uh, previously they were hired as level one. They now have the uh, option to be hired as a level two. 
which actually increased their pay, for, I believe it was previously around $34,000 a year, they're up to about $38,000 at higher. And do you have an idea about when you'll hire those 70 new TEAs? Uh, we have a, go ahead. Yeah, June class where we're actually hiring 170 because we're dealing with attrition combined with the, the adjusted headcount. Okay, thank you. Um, five uniform positions were cut from the juvenile crime desk to leave the unit with only uh, four headcount. What is the primary role of the juvenile crime desk and um, is it able to fully function with only four positions? Dharma Che, Chief Detectives. Uh, we routine um, within the juvenile crime desk falls under real time crime. There's a number of units within that. One of them deals with primarily intake of calls from members in the field. Um, with the passage of the Raise the Age a couple years ago, um, that was their primary assignment where making sure and funneling new arrests, individuals uh, that are juveniles that are involved in incidents in New York City and how they're processed in the criminal justice system. Uh, I would categorize any, any uh, maneuvering of manpower within that as routine, and they have more than enough adequate people currently. Okay, thank you. So raise the age is going to have somewhat of an impact on that. Absolutely, but with what interesting side note, when you look at the decline in arrests overall in New York City, um, the impact has not been as significant as you would have imagined. Okay, thank you. Um, with the, in regard to attrition rates overall, there's a an addition for personnel service cost in fiscal 2019 for $48.2 million, which is due to lower than expected attrition rates. Uh, to what do you attribute the lower than ex uh, expe expected attrition rates, and is it because of any changes in policy or promotion practices? Well, I think uh, in previous testimony, we've, dis we've been asked about the rate of people leaving the New York City Police Department and, and where our morale stands. I think that has a lot to do with uh, the, the attrition rate going down. So morale is up. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, in regard to maintenance cost, a new need uh, for IT maintenance was baseline for 11.3 million. This continues the funding for the IT projects at PSAC2 and the data center. Uh, what is the specific maintenance that is being performed there? And is it related to the same ongoing project or are you funding new IT projects? I can, I, I can. Uh, just to, I mean, I just, you can add if you want, but this is, uh, to be clear, this is a baseline adjustment for capitally funded programs that were funded in prior years where we didn't have sufficient maintenance and expense costs. So when you talk about data, so this is maintaining our data center, uh, maintaining this, the PSAC2. It's stuff that we, we would have to do, we're obligated to do um, for, again, our capital investments, and it's, a, it's simply the adjustment we needed to make the IT expense budget more whole. So does the fact that the funding is baseline indicate that there's no anticipated completion date for these projects? It's not. It, it, when you, if you design a new data center, you then have to maintain it as long as that data center exists. So this is maintenance costs that have to be paid year in and year out, and we're now funded for them. We weren't, uh, we weren't funded in the out years for these when we got the capital funding to, to do the actual work. So the department has... Um, other IT capital projects uh, that you've funded, including I think $85 million for the sustain Sustainability Technology Initiative. Can you talk a little bit about that program? That's, that's um, sure, so the, that capital program, it was to build out new data centers to support all NYPD technology programs. So for example, an upgrade to our network to support the transmission of 25,000 uh, body, uh, sorry, video from 25,000 body cameras. We're transmitting 110,000 videos a day. So our network required a massive upgrade. Massive upgrades to our storage capacities to be able to store all the different types of data that we're collecting. Basically, it's um, the guts, what exists in the data centers that make the technology transformation that we've seen at the NYPD possible. 
And can you just state your name for the record? Oh, sorry. I'm uh, Jessica Tisch, Deputy Commissioner of Information Technology. Okay, thank you, um, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, that's okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Um, despite all the funding that the NYPD has for complex and advanced technology projects, I think the department still uses typewriters for certain things, including accident reports and sound permits. To receive these documents, a person must physically go to the precinct. Is there any uh, discussion about eliminating those typewriters um, and, um, and putting these applications online or an application process by which people can, can do it with modern technology? So I only heard the accident reports. I didn't hear the second. Uh, sound permits. Okay. I can't speak to sound permits, but for accident reports, um, they are generally taken on department smartphone or on a tablet, so not pen and paper, uh, in our new records management system called Forms. And so there is no typewriter required um, for those at all. And uh, members of the public who wish to get a copy of their accident reports can get it on our website. Uh, we have a, we've built a portal that they've been using, I think, for the past two years that Councilman Deutsch worked with us on. And so, yeah, there should be no typewriters involved in accident reports. Okay, what about sound permits? I'm gonna have to get back to you on sound permits. Okay, and is there any way that you could apply online for sound permits? Or even any type of a parade permit, let's say? I'm gonna look into that for you and we're gonna get back to you on that. Okay. But to me as the head of IT, hearing about um, typewriters is horrifying. Okay, me too. Um, school crossing guards, the budget includes 969,000 in baseline funding for 64 part-time school crossing guards. Um, where will these guards be assigned? Good morning, uh, Rodney Harrison, Chief of Patrol. Just if I could just touch on uh, the numbers real quickly. Uh, we're budgeted for 2,638. Right now, we have 151 vacancies. We uh, try to put most of our school crossing guards at the post, the priority post, to make sure that the that the youth get to their destination safely. Um, I, I apologize, I don't have the locations or, or the vacancy posts uh, on me at this time, but I'll definitely get back to you regarding those. And um, I know recruitment in the past was a, was an issue. Has recruitment for school crossing guards gotten better? Absolutely, we're doing as much as we can. We're putting it on social media. We're passing them out at all the different community meetings, especially the build a block meetings that each uh, neighborhood coordination officer has. So we're using all of our resources to make sure we get the information out to the public. So those 70 vacancies are less than what you had in the past? Uh, I, I apologize, That's, the number was 151. And, I'm and sorry. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes it is. Yeah, it's a headcount increase that, you're, uh, that, that was reflected in the right. budget, so that'll take us above that vacancy. Uh, right, okay, all right, thank you. Um, there's another issue that I wanted to address uh, specific to uh, some issues that I'm seeing even in my own district. So this is a little bit of um, chair privilege here. Um, but um, according to the mayor's management report in fiscal 2018, there were 1,772 graffiti arrests, but no, gra no graffiti summonses. Um, what determines whether someone would get arrested or get a summons for graffiti, and why are summonses used less often? Uh, criminal mischief is a crime, is a misdemeanor within the penal law. It can actually be a felony within the penal law, depending on the amount of damage that's done. It's not uh, eligible for a, a, a summons. Okay. And Commissioner, in the um, 110th and the 115th precinct, uh, we've seen a huge increase, or I shouldn't say a huge increase, but we've seen an increase in gang activity. Um, you know, there was that killing on the subway platform, and then there was a subsequent killing maybe a week or so after that. I think that they were gang related. Um, but what we've also seen is tagging. It's all over Jackson Heights and in, um, the, in the Elmhurst area. The one tenth has been responding, but oftentimes, and the one fifteenth, but oftentimes they say that they don't have the budget to cover up the graffiti, and um, it's 18th Street. I, I hate, to, hate to even say the gang names, but I'm sure you're familiar with them. Is that in your budget, and how is that dealt with within the department? I know, I know some of the NCO officers have gone out and actually 
done some of the removal of the graffiti? So, so if you don't mind, if I could just touch on it. So we're doing a lot of uh, work with the explorers to make sure we cover, it up, cover up uh some of these graffiti concerns. Uh, we do a lot of um, networking with the community residents to, <clears throat> to ask them to help us out. Uh, we're, we're utilizing our auxiliary, our cadets. So we, we do a lot of work with our, our interns and our volunteers to make sure we um, uh, get the uh, graffiti concerns uh, covered up with, with the, in the, in the uh, um, uh, inappropriate locations. Is there any type of a faster process if it's like gang-related graffiti? Because, you know, what happens is that they take it down and then it goes right back up, and it's like they're marking the areas as their own. Well, th these are the things that... Go ahead. Go ahead, Ronnie. These are things that we need to continue to have discussions with with the neighborhood coordination officers. If it's something that the that is brought to their attention, they'll, they'll continue to work on it and address it, and if they even have to... Um, uh, put some type of uh, observation posts in place to make sure we identify the people that are continuing to do it, and then we'll address it that way. But yeah, we, we have things in place to make sure it's, it's not a, a continuous an event. Well, it also depends on where the graffiti is. If it's private property, then we work with the owners. But if it's a, a city or state agency, we work with those agencies to get it removed as quickly as possible. Chief Shea will talk about what we do about gang activity. Yeah, just specifically to gang graffiti, uh, Chief Harris, who was absolutely on point. Uh, one of the things we do before we clean it and before we work with the precincts and any community groups, we want to capture that for intelligence purposes. We have seen some gang activity in that Corona Jackson Heights. You mentioned a couple of the incidents, but it's very important for us to capture uh, and try to learn, you know, who was operating in a particular area. And this all comes back to the precision piece of how we've been policing. Dropping, dropping the arrests from the peak over 40%, but specifically targeting, and we've done a number of cases in the 110, 115 in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. centered around gang activity, uh, selling of guns, selling of narcotics, outside of those individual incidents. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that recently we had uh, somebody sending me a tweet, believe it or not, uh, on graffiti, that we also have our transit, uh, transit vandal squad do excellent work in connecting these tags. So the intelligence for us is paramount to connect them. Where else in the city are we seeing this? Is it gang-related, localized in one area, or is it somebody that's just throwing up tags throughout the city and trying to build a prosecutable case? So we've had a lot of success in that. So do you feel like there's enough money in the budget to deal with, this, with these tags? For the, for the removal of the tags? Uh, yes. That's, we don't have money specifically for removal of, uh, of tags. So how Again, is that? Is we it, have to go to, to private concerns and we have to go to the agencies involved. So does it, I've heard that EDC is willing to help. I know Queens EDC is willing to help. That's how the one-tenth has gotten some of it removed. But, you know, it does pose a problem and it also poses a problem with, um, the, the, with public sentiment about because they recognize the tags and what's happened, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm pressing on this. Well, we also work with, I mean, the officers at a patrol level are going, if it's on a store, they're working with the store owners. They're working with the building owners. If it's on MTA property, we're working with the MTA. So there's a, a myriad of ways that we take a look at this. Um, and, and it's also, quite frankly, it's done at the community grassroots level without PD involvement yeah. sometimes. Yeah, we have, we have a beautification group that works on it, but I have gotten some um, requests from both precincts for money for uh, graffiti removal. Um, so that's why I was pressing on that. But, um, okay, all right, so let's talk more about that as we move yep. on. Uh, Argus cameras. Uh, each year, many of my colleagues provide capital funding to the department for Argus cameras in the districts. What is the total number of cameras now, and how many cameras are being planned for installation in 2020? Can I add to my answer on the parade permits and the sound permits? Parade permits are fully available and submitted online. And sound permits, you can get the actual form that you have to fill out online. It's a PDF available online. And then you generally bring it into the precinct because they like to have a face-to-face -face meeting to discuss different parameters, so no typewriters. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Argus cameras. Uh, we have about over 2,000 Argus cameras now citywide. Um, for us, it's not just about putting the actual box up on the light pole. We want to network that camera so that the video data doesn't just live on the pole, so that it can be seen in real time 
by the uh, officers who work in the precinct um, that they cover. Um, we have uh, completed a massive upgrade of all of our old Argus cameras, so they're all like new, modern, and working. Um, we are up to date, meaning for the last fiscal year, we've put up all of the boxes that we committed to, and now with the new funding that we've recently been given, we've already started surveys of all of the different locations for Argus cameras. And our goal that we're holding ourselves to is to fully commit all of the Argus funding that the council gives us in the fiscal year that it's given to us in. And what is the policy regarding um, accessing footage both internally and for the public? So um, we generally give access to our, to Argus cameras, to officers in the precinct where the Argus camera exists. Um, in terms of accessing video from the public, that's usually done through a FOIL request. Through, oh, for, oh, okay. All right, thank you. Uh, Rodman's Neck facility, the budget includes uh, 274 million in funding for the Rodman's Neck firearms training facility. Can you share with the committee the progress of the renovations of the, at the facility? Uh, yes. So we started uh, our formal design for the facility in September of 2018. Um, we are going to be working through different phases of, of the design. This is a very complex project um, through April of 2021. Um, and we anticipate based on a, you know, we're still early enough in design that it's very difficult to put construction schedules out, out in place. Um, but that's the project itself right now is projecting to come in in summer of 2025. Now again, understand the biggest complication here and the reason this construction schedule is so long is we need to keep the, a certain number of ranges active throughout the project. So. Um, we are going to try to engineer solutions that can be creative and bring down that timeline. But at this point, um, based on what our initial design consultants are saying, in order to allow us to continue to use the range to qualify, which is critical for our officers, you know, the, the act of full completion of the project will take till 2025. Another key thing to note is we will be prioritizing the sound mitigation components of the construction, um, and we are looking at in interim or temporary sound mitigation measures that we could put in place at the beginning of the construction phase. So even though you won't see full completion of the project for many, many years, unfortunately, um, you will see imp improvements to the sound issues sooner than that. Is this the only uh, firearms training site, or are there other ones? It's essentially, it's where all of our cops go to qualify. We have a, a couple of indoor ranges in our facilities, um, in a number of facilities, but they would not be sufficient by any means to cover qualifications. We have also increased the number of firearm tactics simulator training centers um, by opening one in each uh, patrol borough. Um, but again, the, the cops need a place to actually shoot and Rodman's Neck is our place. Okay, thank you. Um, and last, and then I'll turn it over to uh, my co-chair. Can you highlight the major capital improvement projects that have been completed recently, as well as the main priorities for the next fiscal year? So, uh, one second, sorry. Our um, capital priorities, uh, sorry. So for um, fiscal year 20, I mean, essentially the priorities, we have the large projects which are Raman's Neck, the 116th precinct, which is a new precinct in Queens, uh, property clerk warehouse consolidation project where we're still in site selection. Um, that's gonna be a central evidence and warehouse, uh, a central property um, and evidence warehouse. 
that replaces some facilities that were badly damaged during Sandy. We also have, I'm just gonna try to move quickly through this, uh, our headquarters security barriers are being replaced. Um, we have the ADA compliance projects, which now that we have the capital funding will be prioritized next fiscal year. Um, and then we have a number of IT projects, encrypted radios, radio infrastructure and systems upgrades, uh, some additional work with Argus, um, and some work in our crime lab. Okay. All right, thank you. I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Chair Richards. Oh, I'm sorry, just before we do, we've been joined by Council Member, uh, Council Members Deutsch, Vallone, and Cabrera. Thank you, Chair, and great questions. Always good to see you, Commissioner. And first off, I want to thank you for coming out to Southeast Queens uh, last week. Uh, really showed a lot of progress that the department has made uh, with the local community, and always good to see you here. I know you're always so enthused to come testify before this committee. Um, so first off, let's get into the nitty gritty budget question. Uh, the NYPD's budget is divided into units of appropriation into eight program areas. Over 60% is in the operations program area, so it does not provide detail, as you can see up there. However, the budget function analysis does go further by using 18 program areas, of which patrol is the largest area and is 30% of the budget, so it is more specific. The council has asked for several years to increase the unit of appropriations to the 18 program areas but we have not received the requests. Only a bunch of TBDs. Do you see that? We're TBD'd out. Um, can you commit to providing a timeline for updating us on the, the U, uh, U of A's? So I com committed on the record, if you remember, in March that we would sit down and have some conversations, and we are having those conversations as far as, far as I, I know. We've had some conversations internally with the mayor's office about how to approach this. Again, I testified in March that the, the plan that you guys set forth, there are some challenges if you create that many U of A's, and the biggest issue being the way that we move our personnel resources around to deal with the priorities we have that, you know, crime fighting, counterterrorism, um, the amount of changes, the volume of changes could become a concern. We think we've, we're making progress on a solution that gets more transparency in the U of A's. And what I, I, I checked in with OMB last night, I believe we're engaging um, your staff, city council staff, um, in this conversation would hope to resolve it over the summer and then have a new list of U of A's that would increase the number um, going into next fiscal year. So next time we sit down next year, we're not gonna see all these TBDs. Uh, I, I don't, I'd have to, <laughs> I, we'll have a new list of, I think we are committing to, to increase the number of U of A's. Mm -hmm. It may not look exactly like that, but I think that's what our conversation is. And, and when can we expect that? I'm looking, is it June? Is it July? I don't have an exact date, but I, I was told. Is it before the end of the year? I was told we're having these conversations with an attempt to resolve this during the summer. Okay, great. All right, so summer, we've heard. Okay, you heard that committee. Didn't, didn't say what year. <laughs> um, we're going to go into tra traffic enforcement. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the safety of our roads and highways. There has been nearly 19,000 injuries this year alone, which is roughly the same as last year. Unfortunately, there was also 67 fatal collisions, a 20% increase over the same period last year. In March alone, 10 pedestrians were killed in motor vehicle collisions. Uh, hit and run perpetrators should should be punished for causing a death or critical injury, but in 2018 there were 46 incidents involving critical injuries where the driver left the scene of the accident and only 35% of these drivers were found uh, and arrested. So, you know, I think uh, we talked about this in prelim a little bit. Uh, the council has asked for more robust investigations on collisions by increasing the number of detectives at the collision investigation squad. Uh, does the collision investigation squad investigate every traffic fatality and do you believe they need more resources based on these numbers we're seeing currently in terms of uh, the personnel that are assigned to our collision investigation squad we have one lieutenant four sergeants and 24 detectives what happened is that as you indicated um, the number of collisions actually this year um, uh, to actually going to May the 12th the collisions actually have decreased by 
6%. We have 74,263 collisions that occurred uh, through May the 12th, a 6% decrease. Collisions with injuries, 14,665, a decrease of 0.8%. Uh, the total number of injuries actually increased slightly, a half a percent, 19,967 plus 0.5%. When we take a look at the injuries, we're looking at occupant injuries, pedestrian injuries, and our bicycle injuries. In the category of uh, pedestrian injuries, uh, where certainly pedestrians are more vulnerable, since it's a vehicle versus a car, uh, the injuries actually decrease 5.6%. That's 3,779. Uh, we continue after five years of consecutive reductions in traffic fatalities uh, through Vision Zero. Um, again, one fatality is one too many. Uh, last year, we had 202 traffic fatalities. Our traffic records only go back to 1910. 1910. 202 is the lowest in our history of NYPD record keeping. And to put it into perspective, the Model T Ford came out in 1908, two years prior to that. So our reductions in traffic fatalities in New York City with a population of 8.6 million people over two million vehicles registered uh, is phenomenal, and this is a collective effort with our agencies through education, enforcement, and engineering, and all our partners in city agencies and our elected officials. Um, we are continuing to work on these issues. Our strategy this year, one of our main strategies you'll see this year is about our left turns. I think that through our programs and our strategies that we've implemented over the years, we continue to um, change the culture of our drivers, um, but nevertheless, we do have collisions, we do have injuries that are occurring. Uh, what happened, as, as you, you mentioned before, in our fatalities this year, um, as of the 12th or on Sunday, our pedestrian, we have a slight increase in pedestrian fatalities, uh, 41 versus 37, uh, motor vehicle operators, nine versus 12, and actually a decrease of 25%. Our motorcycle operators, which we saw a dramatic increase last year, of 42 versus um, uh, an increase last year, so we are also targeting that area. Left turns, motor vehicle operators, and again, through the hazardous violations, we think that we can get a reduction, and again, we don't want any fatalities, we don't want any injuries, but we are heading in that direction. Right, and I, I know we were out rallying just this saf uh, just Saturday uh, on um, tr uh, safety and uh, off of Northern Boulevard. So this is a major concern for communities, and we still are seeing um, f fatalities go up. Correct. Uh, right now, we are up uh, fatalities uh, year to date, um, but nevertheless, as the programs that we've implemented. Uh, the, uh, the enforcement that's being do done out there. And again, we're utilizing our officers, our traffic safety team, and the precinct personnel to talk at the violations that we think are going to uh, reduce the, the number of injuries out there. And through the education, uh, we continue to work on our seniors. So seniors uh, represent close to 13% of our population, but uh, anybody over 60, unfortunately, they represent close to almost 58% of our fatalities in terms of pedestrians. So our community fairs, our traffic safety teams are going out to our senior centers and locations where we have seniors to target that. You'll see our auxiliaries out there assisting our, our children and also our seniors crossing streets. And we've, uh, the uh, auxiliary has been phenomenal with that and I'm working on that program. And uh, I know uh, last year we did a briefing on drones. Have drones been used to map accidents yet as well? Have, that's, have I believe that's something technology? that we are taking a look at. And okay. you mentioned Northern Boulevard. I was out there on Northern Boulevard uh, with, uh, at the 115, um, uh, IS 115, the uh, Martin Luther King uh, Middle School, and we did a traffic program and we had a great response. We had young children and high school students from that area. So again, it's a work in progress. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to move from this, but I, I certainly implore the department to make sure that we are taking a serious look at this. Um, let's go on to DNA quick. So I, we did notice there's supposed to be a climate-controlled DNA storage facility at the new property storage clerk facility. That uh, That is the department's largest capital project at $420 million. How is DNA stored there and for how long? The project is a new, that would be a new facility, so we're still in site selection. Um, we're currently storing evidence in a leased uh, warehouse right now um, at 2nd Avenue, 
um, but that's temporary until we get the the new facility open. So you're in the, you're you're not in acquisition. You're looking for a new. Facility? We're we're still in site acquisition, so we okay. are looking for a, a property. And when does design and when does construction phases begin? Until we Good. have a okay. property, we we really can't make that. You know, we can't okay. put a schedule in place. Um, which divisions deal with the collection, storage, and access of DNA? Support services division. Support services. Yeah. And how many people are staffed to the division that holds the database for DNA? Oh, I don't have the exact number. And I don't. So, so DNA obviously has been in the news uh, very much recently. The, the custodian of the DNA database is the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. So from the NYPD, the answer would be zero. And let me, I'm uh, gonna ask a little off budget questions as I'm sure you've anticipated on DNA. Does the department engage in DNA dragnets where they sweep up a bunch of people of, uh, based on their race in order to take their DNA? No. And um, you know, obviously I wanna steer clear of the case that just, that just happened, um, but there are reports um, out there that, you know, obviously there were 300 uh, black and brown people from East New York whose DNA was taken. You are aware that um, based on the Fourth Amendment, it would be illegal to just walk up to someone and force them to spit into a cup so that you could take their DNA, right? As I said, we do not participate in uh, dragnets. Is it true that the NYPD allows its detectives to hold them until they are uh, desperate for water or a smoke, specifically to get around the fact that you're not allowed to take DNA without consent or search people without probable cause. Yeah, that's patently false. Okay, all righty, so you get my gist on DNA. Um, so we, we definitely wanna see a lot more transparency around the practices on DNA. Um, and right now there's clearly uh, no transparency or accountability when it comes to this. Uh, those I can give you an overview if you'd like. Sure, and, and those 300 individuals, DNAs who were stored, um, is it permanently stored or can you speak to just the, that entire process? Yeah, as I said, the custodian of the DNA database or the local database, which is the subject of much uh, debate lately, is the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, but the collection of DNA certainly is within the purview of the NYPD and most frequently the Detective Bureau. Just to give you a broad overview to dispel some of the misinformation that's in the media, uh, there's currently about 80,000 profiles in the local database. Mm -hmm. More than half of those profiles, we do not know who those individuals are. Those are profiles of crime scene DNA that is collected that we are attempting to identify. When you look at who the remainder are, there are missing persons in that database. There are some police officers that work in the lab and other units that out of necessity have their DNA in that system. What you are left with, which is about 29,000 samples that were collected from individuals, 29,000. When you look at the average contacts that the NYPD has, you are in the millions, however you slice the data. We, we would make historically 400,000 arrests a year going back many years. We are not collecting randomly anyone's DNA. If we did, we there would be a database of millions and millions of people. It is 29,000 people, almost 90% last year were collected at the time of arrest to strengthen the arrest that is in front of them. It would be negligent on our parts of our detectives to not be collecting the DNA right. for cases such as that in a sex crime in a burglary, in a gun prosecution. We were actually asked by the district attorneys of New York City to change our policy several years ago to strengthen those gun prosecutions. So I am very comfortable where we are in terms of the size. It's a small number, and it's uniquely tied to individual crimes that are being investigated. And how long is that DNA stored? That would be a question for the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. There are processes in place that they have for individuals to uh, request to have it expunged, et cetera. But I defer so to there is a process to have it expunged, and how would, so these alleged, I must just say alleged, although you know the Daily News reported on this, 
those alleged uh, 300 individuals, over 300 individuals who were swabbed, so their DNA is still there. How long would their DNA? Yeah, again, I would defer that to the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, and I will not speak to the, uh, the Toronto okay. case with ongoing litigation. And do you, um, do you, so you, you're saying you don't have information on these profiles of the, of the individuals whose DNAs are stored? The, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner is the uh, entity that maintains that database. We collect the evidence, we process it, and we ship it, and if a profile can be developed, they are the custodians of that. So if we requested the data, we would go through them, and would we be able to get that broken down by geography and race? That's a question that would be best suited for the ME. Okay, all right, you get my gist where we're going with this. All right, we're gonna Chair, move. Chair, and yeah. we are taking a look at, uh, along with the OCME, at our policies and procedures. Thank you. And then you be reminded that it does help prosecution, but it also exonerates people. Right, but yeah. you know, uh, just based on the alleged articles that are out there, um, you know, I don't think we had 300 suspects in that specific case. And, um, and I, I know, you know, we were looking to um, I'm going to move away from the case, but I just want to say black and brown people in certain geographies should not just be tested based on their geography and race. And they aren't. Okay. All righty. We're going to move to dispatch times for a second. According to analysis by the Independent Budget Office, dispatch times vary widely by precinct and by borough. In 2018, the Bronx had an average dispatch time of 5.6 minutes, roughly two minutes more than the city average. Uh, do you take dispatch times into account when allocating resources? Yes, we do. And, uh, with, upon instituting neighborhood policing, those times have come down significantly. Jess, you want to talk about it a little bit? The, um, I don't have the numbers broken out by uh, precinct or by borough, but citywide since 2014, year over year, our dispatch times for crimes in progress and critical crimes in progress have gone down. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what numbers you're referring to, and we can do further analysis if there's a specific precinct that you're interested in. Yeah, in the Chair, Bronx, the, the, the average dispatch times were 5.6 minutes, roughly two minutes more than the city average. Is that true, or? So I need to run the numbers. I'll run the numbers okay. specifically for the borough of the Bronx, and we can break it down also by precinct and then go over it with you. And how many dispatchers are assigned to a precinct? Well, there's... There's one dispatcher per zone on duty at, at, at every at all times. Uh, usually, there's two precincts per zone, so one dispatcher would cover two precincts. And do you have any kind of internal review that you hold if and when a patrol unit is, is dispatched uh, particularly slow and misses an important radio call? Uh, yes, we work with the chief of patrol's office to make sure, and the housing bureau to make sure that every job that is dispatched gets followed up on for sure. Mr. Chair, I have the answers that you're looking for. So, we just look at the uh, year to date from January 1st to May 12th. Citywide, we're down seven uh, minutes to seven uh, minutes and seven seconds. Manhattan South is down 10%. Uh, uh, Manhattan North is up 05 the Bronx is actually down uh, 3%. Brooklyn South is down 2%. The, the one borough that we are uh, seeing a little bit of a struggle in is in Brooklyn North. They're up 12%. Queens South is down 1%. Queens North is down 3%. And Staten Island is doing very good at 10%. These jobs that uh, we identify as how we determine uh, our response times are, are pretty much jobs, in, jobs or calls that are in progress. Um, so overall, I'm, I'm very happy with the 1.6% numbers that we're, that we're down with. If there is a precinct or a borough that have, seems to be struggling, we ask the borough commander as well as the executive officers in that borough 
to take a closer look to see what they're doing to make sure that they have a policy or some type of protocol in place to make sure that there's better oversight in regarding the steady sectors or the response autos to uh, put over their um, 84 time, which is letting the dispatcher know that they've arrived to the, to the location and they're going to conduct an investigation. So you feel comfortable at where you're at? And uh, I, I think it was the city, I think, had an article on dispatch times in the Bronx. I, I think the um, numbers are inaccurate. Uh, like I said, the, the Bronx is actually down 3.2 percent this time. Okay. And Chair, and if there's an individual 9-11 job that we're concerned about, we can track the movement of the uh, responding police vehicle by, through AVL, automatic, automatic vehicle locator, which we have on every car. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, let's go into civilianization for a second. The department has recognized approximately 360 positions that could be civilianized. Are you developing a plan to civilianize these positions? And if not, why not? Uh, well, so there's, again, um, part of this in terms of civilianization, funding new civilian positions in a, in a time where we were looking at pegs was really not feasible. Um, so in the past, we were fortunate enough to get 600 and about 615 um, positions funded um, through the mayor's office to initiate civilianization. But separately, as we've testified in the past, we have been doing internal uh, civilianization to increase the headcount on patrol beyond what was funded in terms of new cops and, and new civilian positions. Um, the 300 and some odd positions that we've identified in the next phase, um, you know, absent getting funding, because these are really critical functions, absent getting these civilian lines, uh, it's unlikely that we're gonna be able to recognize civilianization for those positions, but we're still, um, constantly reevaluating what we're, you know, what our resources look like, and if we have opportunities to civilianize through self-funding, self-funded initiatives, we're taking advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And in um, fiscal 2016, you, uh, the department, instituted a plan to civilianize 415 positions, which is now complete. And I want to give you uh, kudos on that. Do you have estimates for how much this civilianization plan saved the department? I apologize, I don't have that with me today, but we can share that with your so office. You can get that back to us. Yep. I want to hop into crisis intervention training quickly. Um, so it's 5.3 million for crisis intervention training, which was added in a preliminary budget. Do you have an update on the number of officers trained since the preliminary budget hearing? I think we had a goal, you had a goal of training roughly 80 officers per week. Where are we at? Good afternoon. Teresa Shortel, Chief for Training. It's presently 90 uh, officers per week. 90, great. Yes, okay. 90 per week. We have 12,686 active MOSs trained. All righty, and the council called on the administration to include DHS peace officers for CI training. Do you agree? And will you work with uh, them to prioritize CIT for NYPD working in shelters as well as DHS peace officers? Yes, we've been in touch with Chief Thompson. He's um, doing the uh, DHS. So they are? Yes. And you agree with that? And in the exact, there is an additional 790000 for CIT overtime. Is overtime funding not included in the money that was provided to CIT in the preliminary budget? Um, so. I think that was in the preliminary budget for, yeah, I think the, the CIT that was funded was a combination of overtime and um, our ob obligation to pay the contractor that's doing um, the training. So it was 1.4 million in overtime to cover the time the officers are in training. Um, and then the OTPS, which is the contract is 1.2 million. Okay. Uh, hate crimes up over 60% this year. Are you planning on adding any additional staff to the hate crimes unit? And how many staff are currently assigned? Fortunately, the, the number that you quoted, I think it's slightly higher. Um, currently, through May 12th, we've recorded 168, and these numbers 
could change um, as the investigations are fluid, but currently we're categorizing 168 incidents. That's up from 94, an increase of 74 or 79% uh, increase. Um, in terms of the staffing at hate crimes, uh, it's something we certainly look at. We are comfortable where we are now. Uh, just uh, where you're at? I'm sorry? Uh, how, what are your numbers? It's there? roughly 25 uh, investigators in the hate crimes unit. What's important to note here is the distinction that these investigations are done often parallel with local detective squads and investigations. So they will at times uh, supplement the investigation that's or already going on, but once we deem it that it is a possible hate crime, hate crimes members will take it over. We have a number of patterns here. The nature of the crimes, uh, I, I could break through them, but for, for brevity, I'll leave it, leave it out. Um, there was a number of uh, graffiti, stickers, things of that nature, where these cases often turn into uh, the strongest lead we have is building patterns, identifying uh, who it is, and, and retrieving the re retrieval of video. Um, but I will tell you that our, our arrests for hate crimes uh, investigated in New York City is up substantially. Okay, um, just a few more questions. 50% 50, 50 increase. 50% increase, okay. And you're comfortable with where your staffing levels are, although I am right now. Uh, I do appreciate the question, but uh, if, if we need uh, to shift resources, we can certainly do that, but I am comfortable where it is right now. And any okay. report of any hate crime is uh, taken very seriously. There's zero tolerance for any hate crime. As a matter of fact, it's so important. We dispatch a, a police executive captain or hire to every, every uh, reported hate crime. Thank you. I'm going to, uh, before I turn it over to my colleagues, I have two off-budget questions. Um, one regard, uh, revolving around 50A. You said before you support the amendment, but not the repeal of 50A. And one of the reasons you cite, uh, cited in your op-ed in the post is 154 threats against officers last year. Is there any reason to believe that those threats have anything to do with disciplinary records? At this time, uh, it doesn't, but there is always the potential for that. This is, uh, this is something that we, we agree with, uh, and I've stated this on numerous occasions, that 58 does need to be amended. We do need to, when there is a final disposition, we need to put the, the charge out there, uh, the police officers, uh, the police officers' identity, of course, and then uh, and, 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 and any follow the, uh, the, the documentation that goes along with that case. That's important that we put that out there, but do we, we also, be policing is a dangerous job. I think everybody in this room would agree with that. And to put police officers more at risk by revealing uh, their identities in certain cases, I think, would be uh, irresponsible. But isn't it true that there are other laws on the books that prevent the release of information that would compromise an officer's safety? And this is why we're like looking to amend 58. Law section. Okay. This is why we're so, looking and where are we at with that? Where are we at with that in Albany? Are there discussions going on? I know they're out of session, I think, in June. Has there been progress with the governor's office, uh, leaders up there? Because we've been hearing this now going on. I feel like I've been chairing two years now, um, and we're still having the same conversation. Yep. So and, well, I, I think the conversation has evolved. We've stated our position really, uh, very clearly where we are in 50A. And is there any movement you see in Albany right now? Are there any discussions going on? Oh. Uh, so pressure mic. Uh, right. um, there have been some preliminary discussions. Um, there are uh, bills that are pending, being considered, but other than that, um, I don't think there's been any further movement. And are you supporting any, uh, have you taken a stance on any of the particular pieces of legislation? The, the, we're taking, uh, there was a bill that is consistent with uh, what the uh, commissioner's blue panel uh, recommended. Um, which is made public, and that's the one we're supporting. Okay, thank you. All right, last questions, and this is uh, regarding the Eric Garner case, uh, and I just want to be clear. I know, I know these conversations are very uncomfortable, um, but race and law enforcement, I mean, I, I could beat around the bush, but it's just hard to, to really beat around the bush on these things. Uh, did you ask the CCRB to recommend immediate retirement with full benefits for Officer Pantaleo? Did, did we ask? No, we did not ask that. Okay. Is it true that the Internal Affairs Bureau determined this uh, back in 2015 that uh, Officer Pantaleo 
uh, did engage in a chokehold. Kevin. Uh, Kevin Richardson. Uh, the IAB investigation was concluded uh, in 2015, and the IAB investigation recommended substantiation that Officer Pantaleo used a chokehold in the Eric Garner matter. So he did use a chokehold? That's what the IAB investigation recommended. Okay. Um, the NYPD has maintained that it had to wait for the feds to decide about whether to bring charges, but isn't it true that there are other cases in which the NYPD didn't wait it fight its officers while the feds were still deciding? There are, yes, it is true. There are a number of cases in the past and currently that the department does not wait for a criminal investigation to complete before we commence our departmental investigation and prosecution. However, this case was an incredibly serious case, and the federal request came from the Department of Justice asking us to wait, and the department, in a spirit of cooperation with the federal government, did wait until such time it was apparent that we weren't getting information from the federal government. So in July of 2018, the, department, the police department notified the Justice Department that if we didn't get some immediate word from them, we would begin prosecution. Thereafter, the prosecution began. Okay. Um, I mean, I started off my testimony talking about this case, and, you know, I want you to know the public is watching. This is a defining moment um, in terms of uh, where we're going with community police relations. So we're going to be able to see clearly uh, from this case, Mr. Commissioner, how serious we really are about uh, holding uh, officers who uh, break the law accountable. Um, with that being said, I want to thank you. I'm going to turn over to my colleagues now for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, and we've been joined by Council Member, uh, excuse me, Majority Leader Cumbo, uh, Council Members Powers, Cohen, Cornegy, and Joe and I. And we have questions from Council Members Lansman, followed by Deutsch. Good, after Good morning. Um, I want to ask you about uh, marijuana policing and, um, in particular, the continued, in fact, increasing racial disparity that exists and who is getting arrested and who is getting summonsed. When the city announced the new marijuana policing strategy, uh, it made a number of exceptions for people who I, I would broadly just describe as with current or prior criminal justice system involvement. And at the time, many of us said that that almost guarantees that the racial disparity that exists in marijuana policing, extraordinary as it was, was actually going to get worse. Because if you're excluding from the benefits of the new policy people who have criminal justice system involvement, well, in this city, because of decades of our criminal justice system and, and policing strategies, overwhelmingly the people who have criminal justice system involvement are people of color. And so lo and behold, in the last quarter where information has come out about who was getting uh, arrested for and charged with um, uh, marijuana possession, it is 92% black and Latino, which is actually up from 89% in 2018, 86% in 2017, et cetera. So in light of that, what is the department's strategy, and will you consider eliminating the exemptions that exist to the city's new marijuana policing strategy? So the NYPD's new marijuana enforcement policies, let me just go over some of the disqualifying factors for a criminal court summons. The person was burning marijuana and on parole or probation. The person was burning marijuana and is a violent offender. The person has an active warrant or a probable cause to arrest, uh, we call them I-cards. person was burning marijuana in the driver's seat of a motor vehicle. person is charged with other fingerprintable offenses. person is not properly identified or a valid address cannot be obtained. And uh, the last is there is a legitimate law enforcement reason to arrest a person for a criminal possession of marijuana. Year to date, as of March 31st, 2019, criminal possession of marijuana, fifth degree arrest have decreased 88.9% from the same period last year. That's 3,947 last year, 436 this year. 
And then uh, year to date, as of March 31st, unlawful possession of marijuana summonses have decreased 8.42% from the same period last year, from 4,143 to 3,794. I'm just taking a look at the top 15 precincts with the highest uh, amount of 9 11 calls, and it's the 4 6, the 4 4, the 5 2, the 4 0, which are in the Bronx, the 7 5 in East New York, the 4 7 in the Bronx. The 3 2 in Harlem, the 7 7 0 in Brooklyn, the 4 2, the 4 8 also in the Bronx, the 7 3 in Brownsville, the 4 3 up in the Bronx, the 3 4 up in, in Upper Manhattan, the 7 1 in Brooklyn, and the 6 7 in Brooklyn. So we're, we are doing the enforcement where the complaints are. Uh, well, I'm, it's, I'm, it's I'm, an I'm incredible very, decrease in the amount right. of activity. The, the that question, was though, was the question, the question was we know the statistics, I cited you a statistic. In nothing in your answer is there any recognition or awareness of the extraordinary disparity that exists. I don't hear any plan or agenda for addressing that disparity. And instead, I'm very surprised that you are citing where 911 calls from uh, come from, because if you recall, it was the production of the 911 and 311 call data which effectively destroyed the department's uh, reliance on that 911 and 311 call data to justify the racial disparities. And it was the front page story in the New York Times that within two days caused the mayor to announce that we are going to have a new marijuana enforcement strategy, which ended up being the one that we're talking about here. So my question to you is, again, in light of the fact that under the new enforcement strategy, the disparity in arrests based on race has actually gone up. Will you consider changing the exceptions that exist to that policy? I think the exceptions that I outlined are an important component of our, our uh, overall enforcement effort and overall crime strategy effort. So um, at this time, no. Do you have any strategy for addressing the extraordinary racial disparity in who is getting arrested for marijuana in this New York City. Every Thursday morning at Comstat, we take a look at summary enforcement in every precinct that comes down to Comstat, and we look at why those arrests were made, and make sure that they're consistent with our policy. One last question, if I may. Are you concerned that the marijuana enforcement policy is resulting in arrests being made that are 92 percent people of color when innumerable studies have shown that white people and people of color use and smoke marijuana at the same rates. Are you concerned at this 92 percent number? As, as the police commissioner, I'm concerned and personally I'm concerned about it. And we're looking to work with the council to, to uh, find a way forward here to decrease that disparity. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions for a way forward? Just to take a look at our enforcement and make sure it's consistent with our policy. And then, listen, we had three shootings in New York City last week. I don't know if everybody in this room really understands the enormity of that. You go back 29 years and it would have been 100 shootings. So each time we take a piece of our enforcement strategy, we have to consider it carefully to make sure it does not have an effect. And the people I spoke about, those disqualifications for getting a summons, those are important issues. That's a part of our strategy. So we'll, we'll work with the council to figure out a way forward here. But every time we do something to reduce our effectiveness, it's a chance for that number to go up. That's, that's three out of 8.6 million people. Take a look around the United States at other metropolitan areas and look at their shooting rate. Nothing even close. But there's another metric that I think that you're not giving any significance to, and I certainly haven't heard any other significance in your, in your answer, which is that while shootings and, and, and other crime statistics are, 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 are over, over all down, the racial disparities in the enforcement that remain, whether it's fair evasion, marijuana enforcement, have persisted. So I'm looking to see that you are going to take that aspect of the criminal justice system that is also damaging to many, many New Yorkers as seriously as necessary. And I'm not hearing any strategy or plan for addressing that issue. Well, we'll as I said, we'll continue to work with the council to find a way forward here. Right. 
Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Deutsch followed by Carnegie. Oh, Deutsch. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. So I, I just want to bring up uh, the NYPD is the best police force in, in the world, and they do a remarkable job protecting our communities. Uh, just last week, I, I delivered a, a letter to Mayor de Blasio, uh, which is this letter here, signed by 38 of my colleagues, um, requesting funding for security at houses of worship. We all know that hate crimes are rising and houses of worships have been repeatedly targe targeted in deadly attacks here in the U.S. and across the globe. My request to May de Blasio is for security funds uh, that could pay for dedicated house of worship patrols for expanding, for example, um, the auxiliary program here in New York City. We have 4,300 auxiliaries and to maybe have a dedicated um, house of worship auxiliary program where people would be able to be in their house of worship, synagogue, churches, and mosque, and, and get the training as an auxiliary officer, and this way they could have direct contact with NYPD through their radios, the same means that auxiliary officers have, and this wouldn't be too costly. Um, that would be basically be um, the, about $2,000 uh, per house of worship in the city of New York. And that request is also for other type of um, meaningful measures to protect um, our faith leaders throughout our city. In fact, uh, last week also, um, my colleague and I, uh, and Justin Brennan as well, introduced a bill that would require the city to provide reimbursements for houses of worships to hire armed security guards. And I don't think it should come to the point where, where we need to legislate something as critical as important to protecting uh, the houses of worships throughout our city. You know, with the 68% increase of hate crimes and more than 84% of anti-Semitic hate crimes compared to last year, um, we just can't sit back and wait for something like what happened in Poway, in Pittsburgh, in New Zealand, to happen, God forbid, here in New York City. Uh, we need to get in front of the issue and be proactive about the efforts to protect New Yorkers. And every time something happens, uh, city leaders, including myself, um, are quick to get on Twitter and to send out condolences and condemn such violent acts that are happening. And I'm, I'm literally, I'm basically uh, tired of the tweeting and, and sending out condolences and praise and condemning acts that are happening. Uh, not only across the nation, but even here in New York City, uh, that's been happening at House of Worships, um, at House of Worships uh, just most recently. My question is, um, you did mention, Police Commissioner, in your statement that we, the Police Department cannot do it alone, we need everyone's help. Um, so, do you agree that there is a need for additional funds to be allocated to supplement the work uh, that the NYPD is already doing to protect New Yorkers and faith leaders? Uh, especially considering the fact that police officers over time is being cut, which reduces available uh, manpower. And that's my first question. Secondly, I also want to mention that just a few weeks ago, something happened with a traffic agent where there was an um, anti-Semitic remark made to a motorist. And I sent an email to the NYPD um, requesting like a briefing of what exactly happened and uh, what was the outcome of that incident and how something like that would be prevented again. Um, and I just wanted to see if there's any update on that. All right, so just uh, as a general statement, we said the NYPD certainly does not sit back when it comes to protecting our all houses of worship in New York City. Uh, working with our NCOs, working with our, uh, in the times of uh, you know, Ramadan, Passover, Easter, Christmas, we each police precinct puts out house of worship cars, our community affairs police officers go out and check on each, on each house of worship to make sure that that relationship is there. As far as additional funding, I haven't seen that letter yet. Um, I, I can't answer about that, but anything we can do to make uh, this city more, more safe that uh, I, I would be in agreement with. And as far as the uh, incident with the traffic agent, Tom, I don't know if you know anything that hasn't risen to my office yet. I haven't seen that. That video was actually revealed by some of uh, my personnel in my office. Uh, that occurred, we believe, occurred on a Tuesday. 
on Wednesday when we saw the video, we directed our investigations unit to open up an investigation in reference to that particular incident. Uh, we've reached out to the Yeshiva world, which was the recipient of it, which they posted it, and therefore our investigation unit has contact, spoke to them. We're trying to ascertain the actual person who posted that video. We're in the process of uh, to get hold of that individual, to interview him, and then also we've identified the traffic agents that's involved in this matter. So it's, it's still under investigation at this time. Thank you, Ch uh, Chief. I just want to uh, just want to mention that um, I did send an email out. So I just, if I could get a response, not to wait at a hearing to ask to get a response of, of what happened there, I sent an email about a week ago. So I just want to put that out. Yeah, um, I apologize and, for not getting an answer yeah, on that. I'll and, follow up on it. And finally, please, can I just want to ask you about the expanding the auxiliary program into houses of worships, if we could do that, if that's something that's feasible. It's, you know, the auxiliary program is volunteers, so. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. Okay. So is it possible to expand that program to I'll have I have to take a look at it. Can't give you an answer right here. Okay, great. Okay. Um, I, so that wouldn't cost, uh, that wouldn't cost that much. Um, all right, so I will send a letter over to the police commissioner, the same letter that I sent over to, to Mayor de Blasio, which I hand delivered to him last week, and they're supposed to be responding to me to see what kind of plan they can implement without, you know, that would, would protect all faith leaders and all New Yorkers that um, by sitting down to the table that would make everyone feel that they're protected by having extra layers of protection um, at the House of the Worships. I so finally, I just want to say, I do want to thank Chief Bonningham for coming out to Williamsburg uh, last week where we had, uh, there's been several anti-Semitic assaults in the last couple of weeks. And I know that the community feels reassured knowing that the NYPD takes these cases extremely seriously. And I want to thank the Hate Crimes Task Force who does investigate hate crimes after the fact. So um, by having extra additional layers of security measures, then we could be more proactive than reactive in ensuring that together with the police department and ensuring that this funding for other types of meaningful resources of protection that we be able to allocate in this uh, coming fiscal year. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you. We've been joined by Council Members Van Bramer, Council uh, Gibson, and Moya. And we have questions from uh, Council Member Cohen, followed by Joe and I. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Uh, good morning still, Commissioner. How are you? Hey, don't go by that clock. Okay. <laughs> it's been 5 to 12 for the last two hours. Uh, I'm going to be brief, but I, I, I know I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record because I brought these issues up to you, but I, I just can't miss the opportunity to advocate for my, for my own precincts. I, I know you personally have served at the 5-2. I see many people on your team have served in the 5-2 precinct in the Bronx. Uh, the condition of that facility, as it hasn't gotten any better since the last time. <laughs> it is a really very old, decrepit precinct house. It really needs uh, some money. And I, I'm particularly proud of the council, the leadership here, the speaker, uh, that in our preliminary response to the mayor's uh, budget, we put in, you know, we advocated for money for a rehab <laughs> of the 5-2. So I would really like it if that could somehow get to the, to the priority list uh, as really and sorely needed. It, it serves way many more officers than it was that was designed for. And I know you know all of this, but it really, it, I, I think that the situation is really, is very serious at that precinct, uh, and we need to do something there. Uh, and also briefly, and I know that we've gotten a couple in the, I guess in the class in April, but at the 50th precinct, you know, just doing the math between, you know, the, the number of officers who are technically assigned, you know, subtracting the number of officers who could be on vacation or on leave for a variety of reasons, and then divided by the number of shifts, there is a, a very small number of officers on duty at any given time in the 50th precinct, and I don't think the number is minimally sufficient. Um, so, and again, I know I brought these issues up to you, but if, I'm going to continue to do it until I feel better about it. <laughs> so, uh, I don't Chief, know if there's any Chief questions. Chief of Patrol's sitting right here with me, so we'll take that into consideration. Well, I appreciate that. I don't know if there's any questions in there, but I just wanted to go on the record. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Council Member uh, Jonai. I'm sorry, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for the uh, work that you're doing, and I want to thank every man and woman that puts on that uniform and puts their life on the line each and every day. I am grateful to you for the tremendous work that you do and the honor that you're doing in. I've got only a few minutes to do this in, so I'm going to bombard you. 
I'll begin first with the uh, opioid epidemic. We have more children dying from drug overdoses than suicides, car accidents, and gunshots. More must be done to apprehend those that are destroying the lives and the families of everyday New Yorkers. Day in and day out, we see the effect. I can't underscore this enough as how important it is and the priority that's needed to properly staff those that are going to be going after these drug dealers in every fashion possible. Traffic agents. I can um, attest to the last several years the requests that we've made in particular City Island as well as construction sites. I'm not sure how they're deployed, who makes the decision, where the priorities are, but certainly City Island, for example, which is a destination place on weekends, Fridays and Saturdays. Every year, year in and year out, I go through the same conversations. My predecessor did the same to make sure that we have enough traffic agents out there. It is warranted. It's for the best interest of public safety. We have a major destination place that, and I'll say it, majority, minority diners and frequents of those restaurants are forced to stay in traffic jeopardizing lives because of the congestion that's created for emergency vehicles. We need more traffic agents out there. It's deserved. And it's City Islanders, the residents, as well as those frequenters, deserve that service. <coughs> Response time, Borough of the Bronx, six out of the nine highest ranking, not understanding why. We need more officers out there. No one in my district says they feel safer today than they did 10 years ago, despite the crime stats. I can wait for the responses that I'm getting from my constituents, is if I double park, within seconds or minutes I have a ticket, God forbid I have a crime that I'm reporting, I can wait hours. I also would suggest, because of the limited resources that we have, that perhaps traffic agents should be trained to handle accident reports and take in our men and women in blue that can be actually fighting crime to address accident reports. When it comes to towing, uh, something that we've introduced a bill, that cars that don't have registrations or license plates can't be summoned or towed. Traffic agents refuse to issue a ticket NYPD refuses to tell. It's a debacle. This is impacting all of our neighborhoods citywide. It's an abuse, mainly by car mechanics and car dealers that has been gone under, that has not received the proper attention by law enforcement. I also want to just put a record. I represent a relatively safe community. And I'm not going to compare the stats to other districts, but my, re my responsibility is to make my community safer, make it better. And it's just not about the status quo, and I think that's what we all should be striving for. Thank you, Commissioner. So as far as the opioid epidemic, we do have a comprehensive approach, and it goes well beyond just policing, which with that uh, opioid epidemic, it can't just be, uh, we're not going to arrest our way out of, of, out of that issue. But we do have on the uh, international, national, and regional approach, we do have a great partnership with the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Task Force at the local level. Each borough has a narcotics squad, and they work with the, uh, they work with the detective uh, boroughs. And each, each borough has an, over, an overdose squad, too, where they go out and they investigate every overdose, fatal and non-fatal. As far as traffic enforcement agents on to the I, island. I'm sorry, I just want to throw that. I understand there's a revolving door, and each time I do this, NYPD says it's a DA, DA says it's the judge, judge says it's NYPD. Yeah, I didn't say that. Uh, but I'm yeah. just, what, the revolving door, how, although the arrests are being made, they're not being prosecuted. Okay, and so right away we do it, I don't know if you were here at my opening statement where I spoke about bail reform. And one of the issues with bail reform is high-level drug offenses, A1 and A2 felonies, uh, they're going to be released uh, with DATs with no regard for their prior criminal history and the damage that they're doing to this city. So that's something that's, that as a local city council you might want to take up with state legislators because I think we only have to the end of June to get that fixed. 
As far as traffic enforcement agents, I'll, have a, I'll talk to Tom about uh, City Island. We, in the interest of time, we won't go into that right now. As far as response time, since the introduction of neighborhood policing, I, I, don't even, I, I can't even give you the number of people we put back into sector cars to reduce the amount of response time. If it's a specific precinct that you're talking about, I'll, I'll be glad to continue that conversation with you. But our response times have gone down tremendously over the last five years. And Commission Chairman, with your permission, I just have one last point I want to bring up. The utter chaos that is caused by these illegal dirt bikes and four-wheelers that have taken over our streets, endangering pedestrians, motorists, and creating chaos. I, fir I witnessed it firsthand. Two dozen officers, a dozen cars, complete and utter disrespect and endangerment and all our officers could do was just sit there and look. They're not, they're not just sitting there and look. Uh, Chief Harrison will talk about our plan uh, as far as dirt bikes and ATVs. Good morning, once again, uh, Rodney Harrison, Chief of Patrol. So uh, every Friday we have a uh, pretty much a task force put together between the Bronx, uh, Manhattan, North Manhattan, South, and we um, take a look at uh, what we call predictive policing to see what's going on with some of these ride outs, be it bicycles, be it uh, uh, these ATVs, be it these dirt bikes that are causing problems throughout the city. And we try to find out a couple things. Number one is where are they mustering up at so we can address them before they, get, before they get in the road. Once they get in the road, it's pretty hard for us to kind of do any type of enforcement because one thing we don't want to do is cause an accident to happen and somebody uh, get injured and in an innocent person get injured in the process. So what we're trying to do is make sure we, we're getting ahead of it before they start rolling. The second thing is we're asking the community residents to give us the information where they're storing these dirt bikes. A lot of them are in storage facilities and things of that nature. So we're doing a campaign on a regular basis uh, for the community to give us the information so we could kind of recover some of these dirt bikes before they start rolling out, and rolling out and causing some havoc. Thank you. Can I suggest a reward? You'll see how fast New Yorkers respond to that. Information leading to the apprehension of illegal dirt bikes. You'll see how fast New Yorkers will provide you with that information. All right, so maybe we can do that in conjunction with the council. I like it. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Let's go to Councilman Moya, followed by Valone. Thank you, uh, Chair Drum, Chair Richards. Uh, Commissioner, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to uh, just say that uh, I'm truly proud of the work of uh, the members of the uh, 110 and the 115 precinct, uh, who have been doing a tremendous job with uh, very difficult circumstances. Uh, and I know that uh, uh, all the men and women in blue that are out there patrolling our streets are really doing uh, a tremendous job to keep this uh, city safe. Um, but we also do have to come to terms with some of the realizations that uh, have been going on. I think Chair Drum brought this up before I was able uh, to get here, but it's about uh, gang violence, uh, the, uptake that, the uptake that we've seen uh, in my district uh, where there was the uh, murder that took place uh, over on 90th Street train station that made uh, national uh, news with, with that, uh, even had my own office that got tagged up with MS-13 on it. Uh, I have funded through um, um, my discretionary fund to uh, bring in uh, paint to do the graffiti removal for both of the two precincts. Uh, but when we saw that there was a lot of the uh, gang tags coming up, uh, I had to coordinate with EDC and bring four trucks that do the power washing and paint. Uh, we did 49 uh, removals uh, in one afternoon uh, with the 110 and the 115. Uh, my question is, that if we know that there are certain um, areas that uh, are uh, prone to sort of the graffiti and gang violence that is happening here, uh, we should be baselining the uh, funding so that these precincts can have the uh, appropriate equipment to take down the graffiti that we see uh, as opposed to us having to take from our discretionary fund to fund this. I think that it's critical for us because uh, we also want to send a message that uh, there is coordination with, uh, with the community and the NYPD who are doing a, a, a tremendous job with dealing with this. I just think that the funding stream to bring the adequate equipment to these precincts uh, is essential. Um, and so 
my concern is how are we dealing with this? And, and I'm sorry, uh, Councilman. It's okay, uh, because I, I asked a similar question, and I promise I didn't set this up, Commissioner, but uh, it's becoming an issue, as you can hear. Right, so I, my question is how, how, how can we better deal with that in communities uh, like the ones that uh, myself and Council Member Drum have, dealing with sort of this uh, uptick in gang violence and the gang graffitis that we're seeing in our communities? Yeah, as far as dedicating funds in the NYPD for graffiti removal, uh, we'd have to have a discussion about that. I think I would rather use our resources or those resources to combat the, the violence uh, associated with gang activity. Uh, in the first place. So I, I don't think we're going to, as you've been saying, we're not arresting our way out of gang violence oh, yes, either. Yes, right? in gang violence, I think we can arrest and, our way out of it. Well, I think, I think there's things that we can do that create more of opportunities in our communities for uh, some youth that we see have uh, not had after-school programs, job opportunities that get them off the streets. We've seen major cuts to uh, a lot of the summer youth programs uh, in our communities. So I feel that, yes, while law enforcement plays a, a big role in that, we also have to uh, utilize other resources to, to give I, these I kids couldn't agree with you more. As a matter of fact, we looked at the top six precincts in the city who have uh, their violence rate is double the citywide average, and we've been conducting a number of meetings throughout the city, and that is the number one topic that comes up, uh, activities for youth, specifically right. after school and, and, and uh, that time between and, and when they go to sleep. Right. So and, I agree and with you 100%. Look, I, I've put in money. I, I met with, uh, with uh, Chief Morales uh, from Queensboro North uh, to do a, a sports program, soccer, uh, with the PLA, uh, especially in our community where that's big, and sort of unite the community with the police as well, uh, get these kids into some really good programs. Uh, I just really feel that uh, the, the gang issue is, is, is not going away, and we just have to figure out how we can better deal with it, especially in uh, communities like mine, heavy immigrant communities, uh, where we're seeing this uh, more and more. Uh, I just feel that uh, we should be looking at this a little bit more holistically of how we f better fund the, as, the as we do, as we do, uh, the uh, arrest activity is people that have shown themselves to commit violent acts. Uh, the, the mere fact of belonging to a gang is not going to get you arrested. But if you engage in crime, specifically in violence, you're going to end up being arrested. And we work very closely with the DA's office all over the city to make sure that we minimize uh, that that amount of violence. And I don't know if you were here when I did state that there were three shootings in New York City last week as opposed to 100, maybe 29 years ago. So this is something that we do look holistically at. And with our Community Affairs Bureau, we have a number of youth programs. But there's a capacity issue there, too. If you look at PAL, if you look at the youth, uh, Summer Youth Academy, yep. there's a capacity issue. It's got to be more than just the police department. So you know, any, any ideas that, that, that you have that could help us with this, uh, we'd all be more than happy to sit down with you and talk about it. Th thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Chair, for uh, the opportunity to Thank you very much. Councilmember Vallone, followed by Gibson. Thank you to both of our chairs. Let me first to say good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, thank you for coming out to the district. We're very thankful to always have your presence out there, uh, especially in Northeast Queens. Uh, I'm looking at the overall budget, and I'm always one that wants to fight to make sure we have enough resources for the demands of a city such as New York City and an NYPD as diverse as you are. H have you ever seen a time other than today where there's been more demands and changes placed upon the NYPD? Uh, in my capacity as chief of department and uh, my, my capacity as the commissioner, it's been about five years now, and it does get more demanding year after year. And that results in new training, new training, health technology. I think training is the big part of that, expanding the neighborhood policing program, which is a key, a key to keeping this city safe and, and continuing to build trust uh, with all communities throughout all five boroughs. So it's, uh, you know, the, any, ask any police chief, superintendent, uh, commissioner, if, they, if they'd want more cops, they'd, they'd probably most likely say yes. But uh, we have to make sure that uh, we have a chance to fully implement neighborhood policing. And I think that's gonna, what's going to push crime down and, and continue to, to make this city even safer. And I agree. I agree that the demands placed upon our police department today are more than ever. And we have risen to that task. I, my concern is, does the budget reflect the need to provide the resources for additional 
officers if needed, especially school safety agents, because as we push to expand school safety agents more and more, and to compensate the officers where they should be compensated based on surrounding jurisdictions. Uh, not, I'm not going to argue with any of that, uh, especially the last point. Uh, the, the New York City police officers need to be paid fairly, as do uh, all members of the, the NYPD. Um, as far as expanding it, that's something that we look at. We look at constantly. Uh, right now, uh, I think we're in a good place. Uh, as, as, the t as time moves on, uh, that might possibly change. But uh, right now, I think we're in a pretty good position. The two last points I have are within school safety, our places of worship, and expansion of those areas as we either legislate or come up to new ideas to provide that safety. Um, we have a package of bills regarding school safety, especially the new memorandum of understanding that's recently been released, but that was since 1998. My focus will always be our children and to make sure that there's equality in all of our schools, that they have the tools that they need, not so much the practices within the school, but to make sure that our principals and schools are universally the same protection. And I want to provide in this budget so that if a school is missing a surveillance camera or they're missing um, any need for their school to keep the parents feeling safe, that I want to be able to provide that, one. And two, as we reduce possibly the levels of private schools and places of worship to provide the safety agents, will we have the ability to provide the new safety agents that will be required if that legislation is passed? And again, that's something that we look at every day. I don't know if you want to talk about the level of school safety officers over the last few years and where we are. I mean, we're constantly looking at this with the Department of Ed and the Mayor's Office. Ultimately, um, while we have reviewed some um, requests to increase staffing, largely what we've been doing is increasing overtime to cover after school expansion, um, where you have programs now extending the hours in which students are in school. You have school safety agents essentially uh, making overtime to cover those shifts. So then my last point would be then, I, I think that's not the road we should be preparing. I think we should prepare for the amount of school safety agents, especially since we're already overburdened as we are. And I can tell you that this council's united in getting those bills passed. So we're gonna have a, a new demand for that as we expand the schools that will need a school safety agent. And as more schools come online and we broaden the scope of safety, there's just not gonna be enough. So let's, I wanna work with you to provide that in this budget. Thank you to both of our Thank you. Councilmember Gibson. Thank you, thank you Chair Drum and Chair Richards. Good afternoon, Commissioner, to you and your team here. Thank you for being here, thank you for your partnership. Um, and certainly, um, as a Bronx Council Member, on behalf of my precincts of the 4-2, the 4-4, the 4-6, a PSA 7, and Transit District 11, um, who I work very closely with, I thank you for your work. Um, and for the work that we're doing together. So I know earlier in the conversation we talked a little bit about civilianization and we've had success in the past of 200 positions and then an additional 416. And so I would love to see if there is a possibility of looking at another number, a figure that we could come up with, understanding that the agency is dealing with the PEG and additional savings, um, but in light of recognizing that there are civilians uh, that should be doing civilian work in the precincts and not uniform staff, um, I would love for us to have another conversation about that before we get to adoption. Any, um, and so any, any opportunity to release full duty police officers back to patrol, uh, I'd take advantage of. Okay, great. And school crossing guards, uh, I love to talk about school crossing guards and I know the executive budget adds 64 new positions. Overall, we have about 2,800. Um, can you tell me what the vacancy rate looks like and what the coordination is with DOE and SCA as it relates to new schools that are coming on the pipeline uh, each September. And you talked about after school programs and other things where school safety agents are also working, but I wanted to make sure that school crossing guards were also a part of that conversation as well. So I can just speak to the head count for school crossing guards. Um, this, the current vacancy rate citywide um, is 151 and I would remind the council that the initiative we put in place two years ago provided us with an additional 200 school crossing guards mm -hmm. that cover above the number of posts that we have. 
So right. that that number, as long as that vacancy rate r remains, excuse me, below 200, um, we're using these parts, these additional school crossing guards to supplement and cover those vacant posts. We also have actually the, an, another hundred school crossing guard supervisors, and when necessary, they can be mobilized to a post. So you have your vacancy rate, you may have people who are out sick, but that 200 additional in headcount um, plus the 100 supervisors gives us a buffer of 300 posts on any given day that we can cover um, okay. above and beyond what we have people for. Okay, and I wanted to ask about the summertime as we prepare for the hot season. I know every year we add officers on the streets in precincts where the, the need is the greatest through summer all out. So I wanted to ask about that number and the rollout date. And then I believe it was you, Commissioner, talked about a lot of the efforts that we are doing here in terms of budget priorities, summer youth and Compass and Sonic, which are middle school summer camp slots for middle school students. And the meetings that we have started um, have been really focused on precincts like mine in the Bronx. We had a meeting with the 4-2, with the 4-4, of which you were at. And the general question always falls to the council in terms of resources and programs that we have in place. But I'd also like to mention that in addition to summer youth, Compass, Sonic, and other summer camp programs, the NYPD has a number of options as well, like the Youth Academy. I just don't feel that many New Yorkers know about it. Um, intern programs, internship opportunities, and so are those opportunities available this summer? And if so, how can the council be helpful to make sure that young people are applying? And in addition, the neighborhood map program that we have that's focused specifically in housing, uh, Chief Secreto knows that. I have one of those developments, Butler Houses. We get summer youth slots for Butler. We get additional resources just because it's in the map program. But the developments that are around Butler also are equally as much in need. And so my question is coupled with what we are doing and will do in this budget what other programs does the police department provide that we could be helpful for in terms of promotion is that community oh. affairs question yeah hi thank Nelda you, Hoffman um, <laughs> chief of community affairs well thank you for asking that one of the things is as you said we have the youth the youth police academy and this year in the Bronx we have it in the 404244 is advertised on our on our website, but we've had a very low um, interest in it, especially the 4-2, and we're doing heavy outreach out there, and um, your help could definitely be helpful to that. And um, in addition, we have our Explorer program. Over the summer, we have a three-week camp um, that we do with them, and um, that's what we have right now. And we have, uh, Nilda, you want to talk about the internship program? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yes. So we also have the 125 spots in the internship program inside the police department, and we've gotten a lot of interest in that, and we continue to do a lot of outreach. So that would also help, um, if you could help us um, do outreach on that too. Okay, definitely. If you could share that information with the council, we're more than happy to help. Absolutely. And the, and the uh, start date for uh, all out is, I think it's May 23rd, with over 300 police officers going back to patrol for 90 days. How many officers? Over, th over 300. And we identify the precincts? Yes, yes it's going yep. yep. okay. to be the 404244. Uh, we have a 67, 73, 75, 79, and the 113 of the commands. And what about housing? I believe it's PSA. PSA 5? PSA 5 and PSA 3. And PSA 4? 3. PSA 3. Sorry. And 5. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Hey, thank you. I have uh, questions from Councilmember Adams, and then we're going to go to uh, Chair Richards. Thank you, Chair Drum. Chair Richards, thank you very much. Commissioner, pleasure to see you today. Um, and thank you so much for the great um, town hall that we had a couple of weeks ago, as my colleague referenced earlier this morning. Uh, shout out to Southeast Queens. We see you out there, Rochdale. Glad to have you here today in the hearing. Um, we've spoken about a lot of different topics this morning. I just want to explore something that we haven't really touched on, and that's the issue of sex crimes. I'm a daily commuter uh, uh, on the MTA uh, every single day. That's how I get to and from Queens to here. 
So uh, the city has definitely gone down in crime statistics overall, but we have seen an increase in sex crimes. We continue to see that. Um, sex crimes going up, rape, felony sex crimes, and misdemeanor sex crimes. Uh, all went up in 2018. Um, year to date, many categories of sex crime, as we see here on the slide, are even higher this year in 2019 than they were uh, last year and the previous year. So at the end of last year, an NYPD report said that the Special Victims Division that said uh, 226 personnel were assigned to the unit. How many work in the SVD currently? All right, Chief Shea, I'll speak about that. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so the most current statistics in terms of personnel for the Special Victims Unit are a total of roughly 290, that includes supervisors, 170 detectives, 83 police officers, that's, so that's roughly 253 investigators, and then the remaining are the, the bosses. And I'd like to just clear the record, because earlier I was asked a question about hate crimes and gave the answer of 25, that included bosses too. Okay, thank you. We've made a series of additions to the Special Victims Unit. Most recently, about probably about two months ago, where we added roughly 34 uh, investigators into the Special Victims, and we'll continue to do that uh, as we see fit in terms of the, the case level and the quality and the investigations that we're providing. But it remains the utmost importance to us. Okay, um, can you tell us how the sex offender monitoring unit works? Do they prevent past offenders from committing crimes or do they respond to crimes that are committed by repeat offenders? They'll, they'll do a little of both, but their primary mission is to account for people that are um, placed into the sex, of, fall under the Sex Offender Monitoring Act. So people that are pleading guilty to certain sex offenses or getting out of prison and being um, counted now as a sex offender, they have the main responsibility to intake those in terms of where do they live, who's coming to New York City from potentially out of New York City, making sure, depending on the level of a sex offender that they are, that we have current photos of them, and then making sure as we go forward that they uh, abide by all responsibilities that they're supposed to. They are not generally going out and investigating live crimes, but they will be conferred with when sex offenders come up in investigations. Okay, and, and, and my final question, again, going back to myself and making this personal, being a commuter, um, do you have statistics on sex crimes handled by the transit unit? I don't have them readily available to give you, but um, it is something we've done a number of press conferences recently on it. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen it. It's. Uh, you know, Eddie Delatore is here as well in the Transit Bureau. Eddie and myself have done press conferences on individuals, uh, and I implore the council to, to take up this fight. Uh, individuals that we are coming across that are continuously victimizing women and young children on our buses and subways. Uh, and, and we see it all too often. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the truth of the matter as we sit here is that we are making arrests of individuals, sometimes uh, people victimizing eight, 10 year old girls on the train. A and we need <clears throat> more tools in our toolbox, if you will, in terms of being uh, potentially able to keep people off the train. Uh, we do not want to be in a situation where we know who sex offenders are and are following them around, surveilling them, if you will, on the train and having to wait for them to victimize another person. I agree 100%, Chief. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Richards. Uh, just a few last questions. Um, let's go back to DNA for a second. You did mention 29,000 people. Can you just speak to what does the process look, what does consent look like uh, in obtaining DNA from those individuals? Do you offer them water bottles, cigarettes, I don't know. Um, but can you just speak a little bit? We, we will collect, so we have uh, multiple uh, different categories. Uh, we will collect individual from individuals uh, through consent, in which case we have a uh, form that they will sign. We co do collect abandoned property. Uh, okay. 
under existing law, that is permissible. So we will also do that. We will what also. Ban, what would a ban in property look? It like? could be a cigarette butt. It could be okay. a water bottle. Um, okay. Could be other things, but those are those are generally. But you would ask for consent first in that case. Or? There is consent. There is abandoned property. So those are two distinct and separate issues. Uh, we will also collect from uh, victims, and that will not go into any database okay. by the OCMA. Uh, a perfect example is that of that is a, uh, a woman that is sexually assaulted. Mm -hmm. um, we may ask for consent in a burglary case where people that live there to eliminate them. So victim and eliminations okay. are collected, but those would not wind up in any OCME database to my knowledge. Okay, uh, just a quick update on the 116th precinct as well. Any update for Rosedale? So the 116th precinct is actually, um, I would say it's on schedule, a little bit ahead of schedule, uh, all things considered. Um, so we are uh, complete with design um, literally in the last week or so. Um, and we are now looking at uh, moving to procure construction services. So the anticipated registration date of construction services is November of 2019. Because of the method that we're uh, procuring, it's actually gonna be quicker than the more typical uh, full procurement. And then we're expected to complete construction right now in the spring of 2022. Okay, so 2019 groundbreaking? 2019 is when we would begin construction, begin construction. So, yes. so yes. Great, great, great. Good news there. Uh, Commissioner, this is a question for you. Are you happy uh, with the Knicks getting the third uh, draft round pick? <laughs> Are you a Knicks fan? I want to know. I'm uh, more of a Ranger what? fan and I'm being patient with our rebuilding years. So it's tough being a New York sports fan. <laughs> All right. I Not as to tough as this job. <laughs> I wanted to thank you um, just as we close out. I wanted to thank you for the work that, uh, you know, the NYPD is doing with our community. It's very evident last week that we are making progress. We still have ways to go in terms of uh, accountability, I believe, and still some, some ways to go on transparency. And I understand you didn't start all of this, but I think you, you know, we hope we have to hold you accountable in terms of uh, moving the department even uh, further, pushing you a little further, even when it's uh, rough and tough. Uh, but I want to thank you for your partnership and friendship, and I look forward to continuing to work with you as we uh, move forward this year. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. And just before we let you go, just one last follow up question. Are you like um, Colombo? <laughs> Actually, we were looking at that clock. Yeah, and like, like, oh, he said 12, 12 o'clock, and then I realized it was broke. I was like, <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Commissioner, in response to the letter from uh, Chair Richards regarding the NCO program, um, uh, the, for the cost and the headcount for 19, you gave us stats for 16, but not for 19. Do you have stats for 19? I mean, I, I think it would be, we can provide that to you after the hearing. I, I, I have numbers, but it's better, I think, if we send you the official headcount, because mine are not completely up to date. Yeah, headcount and total cost, okay? Yeah. yeah, all right, thank you very much. I also want to um, agree with what the Chair Richard said. We thank you for coming in and for spending time with us and for the job that you do protecting all of New York City. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this concludes our hearing for today. This Finance Committee will resume executive budget hearings for fiscal 2020 tomorrow, Thursday, May 16th at 10 a.m. In, in this room. Tomorrow, the Finance Committee will hear from the Department of Youth and Community Development, the Department of Small Business Services, and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. As a reminder, the public will be invited to testify on Thursday, May 23rd, the last day of budget hearings at approximately 2 p.m. in this room. For any member of the public who wishes to testify but cannot make it to the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at councilnyc.gov, and the staff will make this a part of the official record. Thank you, and this meeting is now adjourned. This is how excited the NYPD is to stick around. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner.